Stop saying words because every time you say words, it gets worse. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, Science Magazine takes an itsy bitsy teeny step towards open access. Sort of. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 67. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Welcome back, Dan. Hey, Josh. Really good to see you. Good to see you, too. Man, it is a beautiful day. Gorgeous in February. We'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. I mean, global warming joke. <laughs> oh, it's not funny. <laughs> Wait a second. Hey, we'll, we'll enjoy it however we can. Dan, we've got a big show planned today. Okay. Lots of ground to cover, so let's jump right in. So, Dan, since we've got such a big show, I brought in one of my favorite beers. Okay. What do you have for me? Well, I think you're going to like this one too, Dan. I've talked about Wicked Weed Brewery before, I believe. Yeah, you are a huge fan of Wicked Weed. Yeah, so Wicked Weed... I mean, Wicked Weed the brewery. (laughs) Let me just go back and uh, qualify that. (laughs) Wicked Weed Brewing in Asheville. Maybe other Wicked Weed, I don't know, but... Wicked Weed Brewing in Asheville, North Carolina. And this is their flagship India Pale Ale. So this is like... You had me at India Pale Ale. So this is like one of our favorite types of beer from my favorite brewery. This is the Pernicious India Pale Ale. And I just want to read the marketing speak to you, Dan, because I thought this was pretty interesting. Pernicious implies influence that is harmful in a way not easily noticed. This beer is harmful not because of overwhelming hot bitterness, but because its balanced brightness insidiously ruins your expectations for all other IPAs. That is uh, some serious marketing. So now they're saying that this is going to ruin all IPAs for me? Yep, Dan. This is a 7.3% ABV. Now that might be insidious. 70 IBUs. Wow. But I I want you to taste this, Dan. I don't want to bias your your. your Well, you just did. You told me it was going to (laughs) make all other IPAs taste terrible. Well, let me know what you think of it. It is good. I just made a really terrible face. I was trying to throw them (laughs) off. Uh, No, really, I mean, it's classically an IPA. A lot of activity on the back of the tongue. Like the the bitterness kind of washes over your your palate. Yeah, I guess one thing I get out of this is I love uh, an IPA where you get that fruity character of the hops. You know, some I feel like some IPAs are just kind of hit by the bitter flavor. But just give this one a smell, Dan. Don't Don't you smell the fruit? Like grapefruit and... You know, oranges more of a citrus and, tone for you yeah I, I love that and so i was actually curious i wish that you would let me drink it out of the cold bottle and not the warm glass but well i'd say it's perfect temperature right perfect now. temperature glass uh, i'm gonna put some in the freezer for next time so i was curious what hops were actually in this because i've been trying to track down what are those hops that really impart that that citrusy flavor without all the bitterness because i think this one is fruity and i don't think it's overly bitter for you're not me. thinking about brewing again are you no just okay. so i can identify just so you can go you know. buy more like this yeah. but i don't know if this is going to be helpful so i looked it up and dan this has one two three four five six seven eight nine two uh, twelve different hop varieties <laughs> that are in it they're not even they're listed in alphabetical order so you don't even know the proportion i think this is all the hops therefore you you just you like a hoppy beer i guess i do and I like this one. Thought you would enjoy. Thank enjoy you for sharing as well. And more legal than real wicked weed in our area. <laughs> that is true. Actually, do you know why they're called Wicked Weed Brewing? I do not know. Sounds like an etymology I need. Uh, I, it comes from some some writing. I actually can't remember who did the writing. I should probably look it up. Uh, but they refer to hops as a wicked weed. Oh yeah, I bet. All right, Dan. Before we get into science in the news, thought we could cover a little business. Let's talk about business. All right. So it is hard to believe. But we launched this show over a year and a half ago. It is hard to believe. I I think when we <laughs> set out on this adventure, we're like, yeah, this will probably last about three weeks, and then we'll move on to other hobbies and, and things. But but the number of people we've heard from, um, both with questions, but also people who say, you made this process of grad school and, and postdoc training slightly easier for me, uh, we just kept putting in episodes, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, hearing hearing from listeners who said our shows, even in a small way, 
help them out in some way during yeah. their training. Yeah, that is fuel in the tank. You didn't give me any good advice, but at least I knew other people <laughs> were going through this and that was something. So that, that is true. Um, because that's ultimately the whole reason we wanted to do this show in the first place was we wanted to possibly make the science training experience just a little bit better or at least a little more manageable for people who are going through it. Know what to expect at least. Exactly. And know that you're not alone, whatever it is you're going through. People have gone through it before and are probably going through it right now and you, you can get through it. And there's a supportive community out there to help you. Um, so what we want to do is we've never done this before, but we actually want to hear from you, our listeners. And so what we've done is we've put together a really short survey. Um, this should probably take one or two minutes tops to get your feedback. This is like peer review for the show, basically. Exactly. I mean, week in and week out, we just kind of do what we do and we get emails and anecdotes here and there. We're not getting data though. We want data from you. So we've put together this very short survey and you can find it on our website. And we'll put a link up so you can get to it if you just go to hellophd.com. We would love it if you would just take a moment and let us know what you think about the show and how to improve it because we actually are a year and a half in. We don't have to keep doing this the same way. We're considering making some tweaks to the show based on your feedback. So if there's a part of the show you absolutely love, you should definitely tell us that so we don't get rid of it. If there's a part of the show that you skip every week. <laughs> yeah, we would like to know that we too. We would like to know that too. And we really are going to read these and uh, take your advice. So. I think anybody's just listening for the beer reviews. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, uh, we just do the beer review and then that's it. <laughs> Hello, PhD. And we're just drunk on the floor. <laughs> All right, Dan, related to that, as we said, it's been 18 months. We've done 67 shows. And I tabulated this up today, Dan, and we've actually put out over 34 hours of content. You can actually listen to Hello PhD for an entire day. Plus some change. Plus some change. That sounds like a great day to me. Yeah, if, you, if you've done that, we should actually... Is anyone out there willing to just start 8 a.m., yeah. turn on the Hello PhD, and just keep it going 24-7? Cruel and unusual punishment, Josh. There are laws <laughs> against it. Now, Josh... Recently, people have asked us what they can do to contribute to the show, to make it more popular, to let other people know about it, because they've had some benefit, as I mentioned. And so always we're saying, tell your listservs about it, get on Twitter and on Facebook and share it around your department, put it up on the bulletin board. Um, That's the best way for people to hear about it. And uh, we have a way now that if you want to contribute a few dollars toward helping us defray some of the costs of, of running the show, of recording it and hosting it, and of course, buying beer... Uh, you can do that. You can go to patreon.com and we've got a uh, Patreon account set up where people can support the podcast and help us to uh, get it out to a bigger audience. Yep, that's right. And when people asked if there were ways they could financially contribute to the show, at first I couldn't believe it. (laughs) I was like, why would they want to do that? We do like beer donations, but that's a little bit different. <laughs> no, that is true. And, and so I really, what I did was I went out and researched a lot of options and really think that Patreon is going to be the best way to go um, for our listeners to support us and for us to actually find creative ways to really interact with and support people who contribute to the show. Yeah. So if you're able to contribute, we uh, have a, a number of levels where you know we'll give you shout outs on the show. I think Josh is working on some ideas for some swag. And, uh, you know, look forward to hearing more about that in coming weeks. But what is the address, Josh, in case they want to reach it? Yeah. So if you would like to become a patron at Hello PhD, you can go to patreon.com slash Hello PhD. And that's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Hello PhD. There are quite a few levels uh, which you can support the show, beginning as low as $1, um, because we know... A lot of our listeners are grad students, after all. That is true. A dollar is very precious. We thank you to everybody who has shared the show, uh, everybody who's contributing to it. It's been pretty amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Now, science in the news. Tap, tap, tap. Science in the news. Here we go. All right, Dan. This is going to be one of those special episodes where science in the news is also our topic of the day. And I detect a rant coming up. I've looked at the show notes. (laughs) Slash rant. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, All right, Dan. So I want to bring your attention to a press release that was was put out earlier this week by AAAS. You know them, right? I do. It's like the Automobile Association of America (laughs) service. Uh, 
the other one that's this American is, Association for the Advancement of Science. That is right. And and one thing that AAAS does is they put out some research journals that you may have heard of, including Science Magazine. No, I'm afraid I'm unfamiliar. Nothing I've ever published in. That's right. <laughs> if I haven't published there, it doesn't exist. How great could it be if I haven't published in it yet? <laughs> they didn't want me. I don't want them. Uh, so anyway, they put out this press release. I'm crying over here into my microphone. <laughs> uh, into my pernicious IPA. And then the press release was titled, AAAS Forms Partnership to Expand Access to High-Quality Scientific Publishing. That sounds awesome. That does sound awesome. Something we believe in. We do believe in easy and open access to high-quality scientific results, don't we? I do. So, so what this is all about is this has to do with an agreement reached between AAAS, the Publishers of Science, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They have formed this partnership, whereas authors who are funded by the Gates Foundation for their research will, under, the, under a Creative Commons attribution license, the final published versions of their articles will be immediately available to read, download, and reuse starting January 1st, 2017. Okay, I'm, I'm happy about this, I think. Is that a lot of articles? It's estimated that this will be approximately 10 to 15 articles over the next year. <laughs> Related to that, Dan, is actually the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will pay AAAS a lump sum of $100,000 for the year. So it's not really free and open access. It's that somebody else paid for your access. The, I don't like where this is going, Josh. And the partnership agreement has been established for calendar year 2017, and a renewal option will be evaluated in late 2017. And then a public report on the results of the partnership will be released in 2018. So I guess it's open access for the next year. Stop saying words, because every time you say words, it gets worse. Yeah, and so at the end of 2017, AAAS will determine if this is a sustainable partnership. Is this the time that I like slow clap and then taper off and walk out of the room? You know, <sighs> what, there, what is the news here? There's no news here. Yeah. Somebody paid us to give away some papers, <laughs> which we will then lock back up. I don't understand why we're talking about this. You know, Dan, I read the headline and I got really You're excited. Happy. Yeah, you'd be like, if all science articles were now yeah. widely distributed and free. Or at least moving in that direction in some meaningful way. But instead it's... 10 articles are sort of free because somebody else paid for them and they won't be next year. For now, yeah. And you know, even as I was reading the, the press release from AAAS, I just couldn't help but think like, this is really much ado about nothing. I mean, certainly AAAS knows how much they earn per article. Uh, so, so I'm sure they have statistics that the average article makes this much money and they probably have it broken down by if it's on this topic or this field, people pay the thirty four ninety five or whatever it happens to be per article. 72 times because what is the what is the size of the audience here um if we're if we're doing some back back math how many individual subscriptions are, are people going to make how many individual downloads of that article do you think well one thing i read dan was that a big chunk of of the revenue generated from um, science magazine and other triple as journals actually comes from um, institutional subscriptions and library subscriptions, so not they, individual already, Right, people. so they're already getting paid. So my question is, how many individual downloads of those specific papers can you imagine? Less than $100,000 worth, maybe. Probably. Well, but you know, the other thing, Dan, is when you have an article published in a journal, whether it's open access or not, um, you pay a fee. Like, you pay a fee to publish that journal, and the fee is not going to pay... You know, it's not going to pay the peer reviewers because the peer reviewer, the peer review process is the same, whether it's an open access journal or a closed access journal like science. Peer reviewers are volunteering their time essentially either way. So, all right, Dan, so the cost to purchase one day access to the article is $30. I'm sorry, one day access? Yeah. I can't download the PDF? Uh, I I can download it one day. Presumably, you could download the PDF. Okay. So, I got $100,000, right? Uh, that's how much they got paid. You generously said they were going to publish 15 generously, yeah. Papers 10 here. to 15, yeah. $100,000 for 15 papers. 
That's six thousand six hundred sixty-six dollars per paper. Mm-hmm. So if it has thirty dollars a paper, they would need two hundred and twenty-two people to purchase each one of those papers to come to that hundred thousand dollar mark. I suspect there are not two hundred and twenty-two individual people that would download each individual article. I maybe I'm wrong. Are there that many people in a field researching something like this? Yeah, I'm not sure, Dan. I mean, I know the the majority, the lion's share of the subscription money that journals like Science receive are from institutions and libraries. Right. So how many people outside of an institution or a library would have gone to these articles and downloaded them? Now, now granted, if they're free, maybe more will be able to access them, which I think is great, quote unquote, free. Well, sure, Dan, but you probably there know. are not 222 people outside of an institution or a library that are going to access an article published by somebody from the Gates Foundation. I mean, I would just go to Sci-Hub. Oh, you can't say that. Are you allowed to say that? Some would just go. <laughs> Clearly, I'm kidding because I'm in an institution with That's a right. subscription. Yeah, you don't have that problem. Uh, yeah. I don't know. This just seems like uh, a lot of money for a very small benefit. There's some interesting, there's some interesting questions that, that this brings up, um, even if this is a relatively BS move. And one of the key questions is if researcher if research funders begin to demand open access publishing, will the subscription journals actually acquiesce to that demand? And the answer could be yes if the funder is as influential as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and actually, Dan, you know what this made me think a little bit about? You know how a lot of journals actually have this one year embargo period um, where then the article is made available. But actually, if you remember back. In our episode 34 about Sci-Hub and the publication Pirates, do you remember why that is? Is it because the journals just have goodwill and want the articles to go out after a year? I'm guessing no, it wasn't because they had goodwill. No, it was because of the NIH public access policy that was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2008, which actually made it law that NIH-funded research had to be made available to the public through PubMed Central no later than 12 months after the official date of publication. So NIH being probably the largest funder of at least biomedical research, suddenly this forced all subscription-based journals to release all of their papers to a public database one year after publication. Now on a much smaller scale, you know, we're seeing this with or a much smaller funder, though a very influential funder, who has made the same demand. And who is also paying them directly and also <laughs> funding the research that they are publishing. Well, what's interesting, Dan, is before this agreement was come to, if you were a Bill and Melinda Gates founded researcher, you actually weren't allowed to publish in journals like Nature, Cell, or Science because the subscription, or the open access policies of these journals were in conflict with the open access requirements of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And and presumably the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation would like their their funded research to appear in these top tier journals. Which is why they made the deal. I guess so, but you know I mean let's be honest. Do they need their research to be published in Science Nature Cell? No, probably not. They have probably enough money to get the word out about the research they're doing. If I had to guess, I would say this is a push from someone as influential as the Gates Foundation to try to basically move this giant or turn this giant in a direction more towards open access by leveraging uh, their sway. I think that if I had to guess what their long game is, is to make all research or at least the vast majority of research open access and immediately available And so by taking this very, very small step forward with a journal as high profile as science, what they're hoping to do is to slowly move the ball down the road in a way that maybe other high profile journals will follow suit um, or eventually these journals will transition over to being open access. Special message to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation if you're listening if $100,000 doesn't seem like a lot of money to you, feel free to contribute on Hello PhD's Patreon page. We will give you a shout out at the end of every show, I promise. Yeah, we'll definitely give a shout out. Uh, buy so much IPA. <laughs> Welcome to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Hello Presents. PhD podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, th- what this feels to me like, Dan, a little bit is like 
a record label in 2017 saying that they were going to begin to explore the concept of digital downloads for one artist for the next year, just to see if it's a sustainable solution. As Spotify eats their lunch. Yeah. Oh, we've heard about this digital download Mm -hmm. way of consuming music maybe we should try that let's pick one of our artists and see if that's sustainable well they i think there's the positive side they're looking at alternatives i think if you are in the scientific publishing industry and you are not looking at the newspaper and magazine industry and wondering how you are going to stay afloat in a digital age then your eyes are closed and you're under a rock with your ears plugged Um, i think they have to be looking for new ways of doing it or we'll just have a different method for publishing scientific research, which is fine with me because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not making my living off of scientific publishing, but they must be worried. I guess so, Dan. And, and, you know, maybe part of that is there are more and more completely open access journals that exist that scientists have the option to choose. And in fact, Dan, I know of a few uh, researchers myself, some of whom are very high profile who have decided they are philosophically opposed to the subscription model and only will publish their research in open access journals. And, you know, one of the biggest um, PLOS or Public Library of Science, all of their journals are completely open access. Yeah, also all the Biomed Central journals. And I even noticed some of the um, ASBMB journals like Journal of Biological Chemistry uh, are starting to either are open access or are moving in that direction. So presumably they found a business model that can continue to pay their editors and keep the lights on in their office. If they haven't, then we'll, we'll stop hearing from them. But, but presumably they found a way to do it. You know, I'm wondering, Dan, if maybe some of these subscription-based journals are starting to at least explore or feel the competition of some of these open access competitors. Because actually all of these high-profile journals in recent years have launched their own open access journals uh, that are offshoots of their flagship journals. So so science has their own open access journal. It's called Science Advances. We have Cell Reports, and then we have Nature Research. So these are all essentially open access versions, completely open access uh, versions under the umbrella of these typically subscription-based publishers. I like how non-committal those are. It's like, I heard a guy talk about biochemistry. It's like <laughs> Cell Reports. Nature research. Nature hearsay. <laughs> Stuff I read on a bar napkin. You know, dot com. I want to say, Dan, some of our listeners might be newer to science and research than, than we are. We've been around a little while now. But I can actually remember one of the early open access journals, Plus One. I remember when it first came out, You know, it was disparagingly referred to as the journal that doesn't review their articles. Uh, or the journal that doesn't have peer review. And that has really changed over time. Plus One um, and other open access journals like it have really become much more cited and, and respected journals. And, you know, my experience publishing there, it was reviewed by three reviewers. It came back with detailed comments. We went back and forth a couple of times. I can verify that there is certainly a peer review process um, that that does not suffer uh, just because there's no subscription paywall. Uh, right. And I think this existed much longer ago in physics and astronomy and math. There's archive, A-R-X-I-V, which was an open access way of publishing your data um, that wasn't one of the main channels. So in other fields that aren't the biomedical sciences, this this has existed for quite a long time. Yeah. And I th- it, it can work. It can So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this as I was researching the show this week, and I think we would all agree that having immediate open access to journal journal articles is in the best interest of the public. I think that is true. Yeah. To, To have more information, to be able to build on the solid foundation of other people's research can only make things better. You're not going to, you're not going to get new research and, and come up with a worse experiment because of it, right? No, oh, that's right. And and essentially all of these journals, whether they're open access or not, are employing virtually the same process of peer review. So you submit your article, it's sent out to experts in the field who review it. Um, there's a back and forth uh, with the authors, with the editor, and then eventually it's published or not. Um, and that's true whether it's an open access journal like a PLOS journal or whether it's a AAAS journal like Science. So I guess as there are more and more options for open access, one thing I would actually encourage researchers out there to consider 
is using an open access journal when you're looking to publish. You know, if this is something that seems important to you, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. I know this is something I've really thought a lot about um, as I've been doing more research and thinking about you have options where to where to publish. And so for me, I want to publish somewhere that the information can be out there to anyone who wants it immediately. Yeah, it's it's your contribution. And, and you know, people talk about this research is my baby. And it you know, sometimes it feels like a delivery process. You know, if you want a lot of people to see it, maybe you choose an open access journal because you want it to make the widest impact. If it's going to make a bigger impact in science, um, then, then I guess that's a that's a decision to make, but you know it, it doesn't come without a cost. It comes at the cost of uh, being available to everybody at institutions in other countries, uh, in, at institutions maybe with less money than the one you happen to come from. And who knows if the the addition, the next idea, the thing that builds upon your work would come from somewhere else if it were published differently. Mm-hmm. And one thing, Dan, just to tack this on at the end, we've been talking about the article itself being available in open access journals. Uh, but all of these journals also, the data, the data are also made immediately available. And this was one of the requirements of research funded by Gates Foundation is that data underlying the published research um, is accessible and open immediately. Um, and, and that's only good for, for moving research along more quickly is, you know, if you read a paper and you're interested in maybe studying those questions, you have immediate access to the data behind it. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, Josh, do you you probably noticed I came with the historical perspective on this particular issue. Let me have it, Dan. I, I have a, a quote from Thomas Jefferson in a letter he wrote uh, on the subject of patents and ideas. And I think people have heard this before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, he says, He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me that ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition seems to have peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature. He's saying that it is not just a great idea or good for societies, but that information, that ideas are commonly held and that if I give you an idea, Josh, I don't have less of the idea. It's just you have more of it and now we can we can get better as a society. So... Um, Long time ago, but I think for me, that still holds true. I agree, Dan. I agree. And I think the interesting thing to see will be, what do scientists do? I think I think the power, I mean, certainly if you're a player like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the NIH from the funder side, you can throw your weight around and have some influence over how science gets published. But we scientists in some ways are the contributors and the consumers and we have a lot of options, so I, I think it's a it's a tricky um, conundrum for scientists. There's that pull of publishing in Nature or Science or Cell um, that's very prestigious, um, but at the same time, there are all these options. If you're a believer in open access, you have ways you can make your your results um, open, but you have to forego some of these high-profile, single-name journals. Well, and let's, let's be honest, not everybody is publishing in Science or Nature or Zell every single paper. So if you, have, if you have one in the works that will not go to one of those three journals, um, there's much lower cost to choosing something open access. And, and you get the choice. It's your choice. That's right. All right, Dan, let's move on to our word puzzle. Okay, the clue last week was you can extract this rare metallic element from a heavy stone to make electronics and catalysts. Any guess? I can give you a hint if that helps. Hmm, I'll take a hint. Okay. Uh, this is a, a, an element used in light bulb filaments. Oh. I have a guess. Old style light bulb filaments, yeah. I don't know that I have any of these, but let's go tungsten. That is correct. It was tungsten, and it comes from the Swedish language. You know, I love to get a language as other Latin or Greek. Yeah, how are they doing? I don't know. <laughs> Very relevant joke. I don't know. Uh Tungsten, which means heavy stone, directly translated. Um, you know, the chemical symbol for tungsten is W, which is kind of weird, but it stands for Wolfram, if you've ever heard of Wolfram. And uh, that translates from German, which means wolf soot or wolf cream. I've also seen wolf froth. Wolf cream? Yeah, wolf cream. <laughs> Supposedly, it has something to do with the fact that when you are um, smelting or purifying tungsten, it 
consumes a lot of tin or or tin froths at the surface as an impurity. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's where Wolfram comes from. Yeah, I went through a smelting phase for a while. I bet you did. You probably bought a, a smelter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know you did. All right, Joshua, let me give you the clue for next week if you're ready. I'm ready. Lay it on me. Much has been written about this device used for detecting falsehoods. I'll read it one more time. Much has been written about this device used for detecting falsehoods. Remember, I'm looking for a scientific word described by the clue, and once you get it, you'll find that the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. If you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellophd.com, and I will randomly select a winner from all the correct responses and send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. Well, Dan, it's been a great show. Thanks for listening to everyone out there, and if you have some feedback on this show, we'd love to hear what you think about open access versus high-profile journals. You can email us podcast at hellophd.com, or you can tweet at us at hellophd. I would love to hear from uh, some brave soul in the publishing industry um, to tell us about what is the current thinking? What are you uh, working toward? How do you see the market moving? Uh, what are the downsides of open access? If somebody has some of those, I'd be really interested to talk to somebody who's part of that business. Yes, I would love to hear someone pitch the case for paywalls. We will be nice, I promise. Mostly. Thanks to everyone who's been rating us and leaving us reviews on iTunes. We see those, we love those, and that helps new people to find the show. And just as a reminder, we really, really would love everyone to take a minute to go to our survey, go to hellophd.com, spend a minute and give us your feedback on how we can make the show better. And also, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the show, you can go to patreon.com slash hellophd. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash hellophd. We would greatly appreciate it. Hey, Josh, thank you for the wicked weed. This is pernicious. It may ruin my future IPA enjoyment. The only way to tell will be to sample some future IPAs. Sounds like a plan to me. We'll see you in a few weeks. See you next time.